This is Kimberly Quinn, host of the Mindcraft podcast, and I can't tell you how much fun I have had doing this podcast. I, I started when the world closed over the pandemic in, a, in an attempt to spread some positivity out there and give people some strategies to enhance their own well-being and reduce anxiety and all that. Now, two years later, we're still going strong and now listened to by 52 countries across the world. And I've even helped some of my students get going with their own podcasts. It's super easy to do. And I'll tell you, if you haven't heard about Anchor by Spotify, it is the easiest way to make a podcast with everything you need all in one place. I'll just explain for you. Anchor has tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. When hosting on Anchor, you can distribute your podcast on listening platforms like Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and more. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. And best of all, Anchor is totally free. Download the Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. It is a ball. Start today. Greetings, Minecrafters, and welcome to another hopefully interesting Minecraft episode. My name is Kimberly Quinn, and yeah, I'm just I'm kind of excited to talk about this new phrase, concept, thing going on in the wake of the Great Resignation, referred to as quiet quitting. And quiet quitting, this new you know term that's happened sort of post pandemic. There's a reason for it. I'm going to talk about the reasons for it. But basically, people are coasting. It's not like they're not doing their job. They are doing their job. They're just doing exactly bare bones, you know, um, almost in a punch-in, punch-out kind of way. They might be smiling and nodding. We're going to talk about all that. Basically, quiet quitting refers to that person who now feels like their position uh, at their company or agency or whatever they're doing is like a piece of gum that they have chewed the flavor out of. So here are a couple of uh, points and I'm, I'm taking this so I can, I, it's okay to plagiarize myself. I just, I recently wrote a, an article for psychology today, uh, just a week ago tomorrow, actually. And, uh, so if you want to look up all the references there, you can, I just, there's only a couple actually, cause I try not to throw too many stats at people cause where it hurts your head, but it is important to have some statistics because, you know, it's nice to have the facts to support one's opinions. Right. So, so here's the thing. Last year, uh, about seven out of 10 employees reported experiencing burnout. Now, obviously, burnout is kind of a big word. I mean, short word in reality, it's two syllables, right? But it's a big word because it doesn't just mean a little tired. And it doesn't even mean fatigued. It's kind of soaring past fatigued into I don't care anymore. Even if somebody really loved their job, you know, they love their job. And so, um, yeah, we're going to get to, well, I just want to kind of throw out some points here and then we're going to, we're going to dive in a little deeper. So the next one is when the inflation rate soared to approximately 9% in July of 2022, the average employee raise capped at a mere 3.4%. So that's, you know, it's kind of like, thank you, because that's better than no raise, but I'm still underneath, you know, by quite a bit. You know, I'm still underneath by quite a bit because that, you know, and it's nice and everything. It's not saying it's not nice. It's better than, you know, it's a half full perspective. In reality, though, when you walk into the grocery store, you know, and you're on a, you're on a budget, you got a couple of kids or you're maybe at the single parent home or maybe you're by yourself. There's no second income, blah, 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 blah. You know, it's like, thank you. But this is really tough because it's not cutting it with what the price of, you know, food costs and everything else is. And then the third one is. Chronic burnout, poor compensation, increased workload, and diminished appreciation have led employees to reevaluate where their effort is going. And, you know, personally, even outside of the quiet quitting concept phrase, I think this is one of the lessons that the coronavirus really taught us is to reevaluate where our effort's going. You know, lots of people have talked about um, you know, they were talking about being caught in that gerbil wheel, hamster, you know, the hamster gerbil on crack flying on the wheel, you know, taking family and friends for granted. I mean, we've all, we've all had moments of that because we tend to just, you know, sort of know that our family and friends are always going to be there. They're always going to listen. They're always going to forgive us if we 
work 95 hours and we come back and apologize kind of thing. And this, I think the Rona virus, as awful as it was, you know, most things aren't all bad or all good, you know, right? Even a funeral is, is bad and awful and sometimes often tragic as those are. You know, the one positive, I guess, if you can come up with anything, is that people gathering, human beings gathering together for support and love and kindness, you know, at a time that's so hard. So even with a, you know, a pandemic, I guess the blessing that mess was that we were kind of forced to reevaluate, you know, where our life minutes were going, our very valuable, our most precious commodities are our life minutes. And we learned that maybe um, we need to really think about what we're spending those on, you know? And then uh, lastly, for the the key points, here's how psychology today does it. Uh, they, you have key points where you get into the, the, the beef of it. So quiet quitting is a way that employees reclaim their power and return to a healthier and happier work-life balance. Okay, so we've talked about you know, burnout being tired leads to fatigue, or actually there's exhausted in there first, then fatigued feet. Fatigued is longer, <clears throat> you know, more long lasting than exhausted. And then burnout, <clears throat> excuse me, burnout is kind of when you just hit the wall when somebody just loses. It's, it's like they've had the life sucked out of them. So we've talked about that. You know, we started is it's like chewing, it's like a piece of gum you've chewed the flavor out of. You know, when you started the gum, it was good. You know, you liked your job or, career or calling, those are all different. And and the reason you you've you've lost the juice is because um f- f- sort of a slow loss of control, you know, a lot of external circumstances, you know, kind of uh you know beating people down kind of thing. And I know actually I did a, a talk, this is pre quiet quitting talk, but just last May I did a talk for the student affairs crew at Penn State. And what a lovely group of, I hope I go back there because they just were some of the nicest, kindest, just funny, just good group of people to ever hang around with. They were just really, really good people. Um, They were really openly honest about caring so much about the students at Penn State and wanting to prevent this from happening. And they were, some of them were very, candid and saying that they were right on the edge and they were aware of it yet, you know, short staffed and people, you know, that we were so, uh, actually, I think they had just come back from being remote at that time. So there's a lot of that left over where stuff just doesn't happen the same remotely. We know that it doesn't also the isolation, not seeing our colleagues, you know, for lunch and at the water cooler and going for a walk outside on that beautiful campus. I was right there when all the blooms were happening in May, just gorgeous, you know, I'm missing that human interaction and the social stuff. And they were really sort of honest about basically saying help. I don't know how much I really like it here, but I don't know how much I can, more I can take of this, you know? Uh, and so uh, we, had a, we had a, you know, so a really good talk about, you know, getting some things in place and they have a really supportive, uh, they're just a really supportive group there. And, so here's the thing, and that's kind of makes the that kind of like is the point right there is we're talking about good people, good people who love what they do. In this case, they love their students and they want so much to not land in this place of burnout because of burnout, when once you hit the wall, you hit the wall, right? You want to throw in the towel. And then <clears throat> if you kind of throw in the you know inflation piece, and if you put those together and you've got you know young families starting out. You've got a single parent. You've got a person by themselves. You've got two partners. One lost their job for whatever reason, for the pandemic, whatever, 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 whatever. And it's just, there's just been a lot of stress in the air, I guess. And, and so, and it's also, there's a lot of emotions going on and, and fear, right? A lot of fear-based thinking, which we know can be cyclic. And then fear-based thinking leads to fear-based feelings, which then leads to fear-based behavior which is I better box check for a while until I can find something better. So now what we have across the country, I'm sure to some degree worldwide, and certainly let me know know those listeners. I Last I checked, uh, this wonderful podcast had was being listened to by over 54 countries. 
um, in addition to the United States. So thank you, everyone who, who's tuning in. And please let me know in the comments section. You can also you can also find this podcast on YouTube. You can put comments there. So anyway, um, what we have now is a situation where lots of people, lots of good-hearted people who have made maybe devoted lots and lots of life minutes, you know, you know, and, and investing in their, you know, careers and callings. And now they are sort of, um, just going through the, been, you know, feeling that they're reduced to, to a situation of going through the motions, you know, showing up maybe exactly on time, leaving the minute the clock ticks done. We're not talking about cutting corners. Now that's the late stages of quiet quitting. Because these are integrity-based people. Like, okay, this is my job description. Da 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 da. You know, and 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 I know, I know. You know, where I work at Champlain, I love it there. And I'm and I and I I I got the same um, feeling from this Penn State crew that that was a whole group of people that's used to going above and beyond. You could just tell by the, you know, the few hours I spent with. I spent like a half a day with them, I guess. <clears throat> you could just tell. You know, they and of course we've got you know, medical folks and teachers and firefighters and just name, you can just, you can just name whatever uh, profession you're in. And many people are really in it to win it. You know, it's not only, you know, obviously we, most of us need money, but many people are drawn to their job career callings, especially because of the difference they're making in the world. And that's a real tough one when good people making a difference in whatever reason or whatever way, I mean, for whatever reason, whatever way. And that can be anybody. It doesn't have to be the Peace Corps. We can make a difference, at, you know, anywhere uh, by how we bring our own success to it, right? And so also there's also an underlying sadness sometimes with people because they feel like they've lost their sense of agency and control. I used to love it. I used to have more of a voice, or I still have a voice in the sense that I'm saying my voice, but I'm not being heard. Another thing that's happening is my voice, my voice is being heard by my manager, whoever my report to person is. Those are different words or different fields, obviously. And they're, they're burnt out too. And they want to help me, um, but can't because they're fried too. I was actually talking with a manager recently, not in higher ed, actually. <clears throat> and they were talking about really so much needing for somebody to come in to do uh, to, to manage um, the front desk, and 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 didn't want to ask this one person who's been this you know just old faithful through the whole thing, and this manager had been taking it on herself to have, to not ask this person, and and then it was like and they're both fried, right? So she didn't want to kind of abuse her her manager, and so it was taking it on herself. Because this person had the one day off, and then it's seven days a week, then you're rolling to your neck, then you're rolling to your work week, then then it's 12 days in a row. And, you know, so then then what do you do? When you have, you know, the, the man, good-hearted managers are trying to take it off, there, and then everybody's lost their voice, basically. And that's what's happening, because this is, this what's going on is what's in the wake of, of, the quiet quitting is in the wake of the great resignation. So the good people, I'm not saying anybody that, I'm not just make sure I'm saying a disclaimer. I'm not judging those who, you know, chose to leave during the great resignation or they lost, that wasn't their choice. There's that too. Right. <clears throat> but no matter how you cut it up, the people that stayed, there are far fewer people who, who stayed now. And I'm sure I know I'm in Vermont, as most of you know, and I was just down in Massachusetts. I was just down in Boston, Boston business or visiting our oldest son for his birthday and his new bride. And there are dining, dining hall, dining, uh, halls, rooms, whatever, restaurants that are roped off. And even in Vermont, you know, we don't have a, the population they have down there and it's not different. It's just like a per capita difference, but it's not different. They don't, and it's, and, and it's not, they don't have the staff. So it's been, you know, and, and that's true in hospitality. That's true in lots of different places. And so what's happening here is the people who are there are just getting fried and, and we're all human here. And these people are superheroes and there's, and I get to label everybody superheroes. And of course the medical crew through the whole pandemic and they're, they've got to be beyond fry. We got the fire fighters, all the emergency people, right? Ambulance and all that. Then we've got people at gas stations, which we couldn't do without them either. We need everybody or we couldn't get where we're going to dot. The ambulances couldn't fuel up without them. 
We've got the grocery store people. We've got the retail people that got to keep the economy going. Like there isn't anybody who's not important, obviously. And this is what's happening is when we're short staffed on all these fronts, human beings have limits. And even though we've all been, you know, we've been flying around with S's on our chests, you know, it, it's kind of like all hitting the wall right now. I mean, it's just what's happening. People are fried and they're done. And remember, we're talking about good people going the distance. It, you know, and I've run one, exactly one marathon in my life with our oldest daughter, Caitlin. And uh, she's a champion runner. I came I came in in a fast five plus hours. But the point is, I, I can relate this to running a marathon actually exactly 10 years ago because I was 47. And the feeling you have when you cross the finish line is such an accomplishment, no matter what your time was. I was all about the t-shirt and the medal and also the post-marathon eating and wine drinking. That's what I was all, I was all happy about that. I just I wore that t-shirt and that medal for three days to, to Champlain College just because, because I could. It was just, I just was, I felt like I wanted to sleep in it, take a bath in it, everything. So here's my point is that that feeling of accomplishment and, and that fulfillment that genuine, authentic fulfillment for people who are really doing their thing and, and using their signature strengths at their, at, their, at their jobs, careers, callings, and they've got a friendship circle in there. And it's just, it's bigger than the paycheck, you know? So now what's happening with them being sort of forced into a situation of a slow burn, quiet quit is, is again, that diminished sense of agency, that diminished sense of autonomy that we as adults need as we need oxygen. Take that away and it's a straight road to sad and depression, to sad, sadness and depression. And we need, we uh, or added part of that. Part of that is is, is directly related to our sense of meaning and purpose because without a sense of meaning and purpose, that is a straight, excuse me, straight road to sadness and depression. And it's all intertwined together. Because we need that, like we breathe O2. It's just how it is. And I'm also going to put out there that I think um, it's quite possible also that I think self-esteem is taking a toll. Because when you take these good people who have been at this for a long time, in the trenches, on the front lines, in various ways, dealing with other people in a pandemic where we're all vulnerable for whatever reasons, and, and feeling as if you can't do your job anymore or doing it as well because you've been weakened in a sense because you just, because it's, it's, it's used to, you know, race to work and love it. At least most days we all have a bad day here and there. And now you're dreading what you once loved and what the heck happened here. And I was always different than that. How come this is different now? And how come I've lost my sense of control and how come I've lost a sense of satisfaction I used to have. How come I feel like a walking flatliner? You know, when I see my students and my, my, my brain is telling me I love them. And I know in my heart I love them, but, but I'm starting to become numb. And fill in the blank with whatever that is with your students. It might be, you know, your, employ, your employees in different ways, your, you know, whatever. And now they're feeling like they've, um, like they've done something wrong or like, I almost feel like a bad puppy or something, you know, just, you know, just crawling into a corner and that's ridiculous. Good people in a, in a situation where they've, you know, put all this energy and effort in their lives with their life minutes now feeling, feeling badly. It's just, it's absolutely awful is what it is. It's awful. Okay. So I came up with two types of quiet quitters for my psychology today article. It's super general. And the first one is I would refer to as the passive quiet quitter. These are the coasters. I mean, they're both coasting, but these are more kind of more evident coasters. They're generally fed up and they're box checking simply to acquire the paycheck. Okay. This employee may not have any kind of plan to leave right now, but they're on autopilot. They're on autopilot and they're doing the bare minimum. So they are doing their job because the quiet quitters are, are conscious of wanting that paycheck and uh, not wanting to be fired, just to be blunt. So, you know, somebody could sit, can't come back and say, well, you didn't do this, that, or this. They might be used to you doing this, that, this, that, and this, and 
you used to go above and beyond and stay after a half an hour and drop somebody, drop something or somebody off after work. You might have been on a committee that you no longer have any any desire to be on anymore, right? And the, the passive quiet quitter is smiling and nodding. So you're not catching on to anything because they're not being cranky or anything. They're not, there's just not a lot of water cooler talk, right? And it's a slow, it's a slow, slow gig with these got with the passive quiet quitters because they just have minimal engagement, minimal social interaction in the workplace. Okay. But they're still smiling at you and everything's you know, looking okay, looking like it's fine. Um, but they're coasting. They're coasting just, just to get to payday, checking the boxes. Okay. The next one, the only other X one, the only other one is the, the, at least that I have the active quiet quitter. Okay. So this person obviously is also coasting, but this person has a much more conscious awareness of what he or she or they are doing. Right. So they are very clued in to that. They are done at this current job and they're going to, they're also going through the motions just as a passive quiet quitter is, but the active quiet quitter is diligently planning their escape. They're not letting anybody know that, but they are, they got feelers out there. They're talking to their connections. It's all hush, 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 hush. And they are acutely aware. They are acutely aware that they have outgrown their current work environment. They, they're, and again, like it's a, it's with a tenacious, tenacious, like a, a, a tenacity. They are watching for the green lights to point them in a new direction. So this is the crew that's typically very, very self-aware, very, very passion-driven, and they're kind of not willing to let their their flame get, get um, you know, snuffled out. They're just, they're not willing to. They want to, they enjoy what they do. They want to, they want to be satisfied again. They want to have joy once again. They know what they're pr- pretty aware of their signature strengths, and they are actively looking to use those someplace else. So they're watching, paying attention to the signs, the sign, the you know, green lights, I like to call them. Actually, my friend Tom, who uh, he's my synchronicity friend. And one, boy, once you're onto this, being in receptive mode, it's like a faucet you can't shut off, nor would you want to. But watching for the green lights, that's just, you got a, you got a phone call out of the blue from this one who knows somebody who has an opening. They're paying attention to all that stuff. And they're doing so while safely, safely collecting a paycheck as they search for something new. They too are smiling and nodding, telling a good joke once in a while, um, minimal water cooler chat, and uh, definitely not on the committees or any doing any of that extra stuff unless they smell that somebody might catch on and then they might stick stick around for a little while on a committee. But most of all, this crew is pretty much calling it done. And so some signs of quiet quitting might be employees taking their PTO, which is paid time off, in, um, and I know they call it different things in different uh, companies and different, you know, higher ed I know is different from corporate America. It's faculty schedules different than, um, you know, doing different things. And it's, it's, it's just all called different things. So paid time off, vacation time, sick time, leave, right? So, um, taking the time off, meaning, uh, and I mean, in little spurts, like in one or two days at a time, one or two days at a time. Now this would only be true if the company agency or whatever it is, uh, does not pay out for it when, a, when an employee eventually leaves. So if, if they've racked up two, three, four weeks vacation, but if they leave that gets lost, right? Like it just, if it's a suck it up buttercup situation, they're definitely going to take every last minute of that. No question. Um, otherwise, the reverse would be true. So that's important to know either. If an employee, if, if, the, if the agency, actually the first agency right out of graduate, when I got my first master's degree, right, the agency I worked for down in D.C. did pay you um, your PTO, which I honestly didn't know that. And I was saving all of it to be with our, our firstborn son when he was born. And so I took the maternity leave, didn't realize that they paid out for it. And then my husband got transferred right after a few months after we had him. And, um, I got a nice check cause I didn't know they did that. So surprise. 
wasn't a lot of money because it was back then, and I was my it was my first job out of graduate school. But still, a surprise is a surprise, and we were very very grateful for it at that time. But if but if uh, a job doesn't do that, there certainly isn't any sense in hanging on to it, right? So, but also watch out for the hoarding if you do pay out for it, because that's exactly what they're doing. They're saving it so they can they can you know drop the res you know the, the resign letter on your desk and then grab a check and run. And then another thing is um, very subtle disengagement, as we talked about, with workplace conversation. So they're smiling and nodding and answering you. They're all talking to you. We want to keep it all going on, but nothing extra. Not attending anything extra is the other one. Not volunteering for anything, even if it's fun. There might be, um, you know, em- you know, employee picnics, employee this, employee that, uh, bowling nights, this, that. Nope, no thank you, Okay. You also might uh, see that they are taking breaks throughout the day more than usual. So they're, um, you know, just taking little 15 minutes here and there. Why? Because they don't care anymore. They're done. Underneath that smile, they're done. The sixth one is leaving more often for a few hours during the day for quote unquote doctor or dentist appointments. Not saying they're lying. Okay, but they might might as well schedule all that stuff now before they have to start a new job, right? When um, because they don't care if somebody says, "Hey, well, the supervisor, well, you know, you left for three hours yesterday." I realize that I'm sorry. I had a counseling appointment. You know, I was, oh right, I had a dentist. I got some having some dental work done. I'm sorry about that. There's going to be a series of that little root canal something because you just don't care. Don't care. Um, the next one is the seventh one is you may start, they may start to show up late or leave early and it might be just 10 minutes. And they know that probably a, a manager is not going to say much about that. It might even lead up to a half an hour. I had to go pick up my child. Da, da, da. Next day, same thing. I had to go pick. And normally if you wanted to keep your job, you might save that for when it's an actual urgency. You wouldn't just kind of, you know, be sort of laxed about it, but now you don't care. So why not? And then the eighth one is showing a, oh, sorry. Oh, there's nine. Never mind. Showing a diminished sense of interest. So you might have been super interested in maybe the company newsletter or um, I know in, in, I try to keep it not with just higher eggs. I realize that is not everybody, obviously. Um, And, you know, newsletters. And actually, I do a newsletter and I'm super interested in that. And sometimes there's writing groups or this group or that group. There's well being groups, I think, across the, country and all whatever you're doing there's tons of well-being stuff going on across the country you know um walks during lunch or this or that or interesting things sometimes book clubs i know our daughter's in a book club that comes right out of she teaches uh third grade and they all do that and then and then the ninth one is not asking many questions in general so even if they're work related because let's say you've got a strategic plan or whatever the words for that are with with uh your different fields there's whatever leads into the future whatever that might look like mission statement or just talks just conversations what would this time next year where would we like to be with sales and quotas and you know what what would we like to i have two both sons are in sales i know their their world looks dramatically different than mine does so you know where might we want to be with sales of this or sales of that you know kind of setting the bar and That the quiet quitter is going to sit in that meeting and smile and nod and maybe not ask many questions, if any. Why? Because they're not going to be here next year. That would be the reason. At least they hope it's that way. And obviously, it's an employee's market right now, so they probably won't be. (laughs) And so, any for any leaders who might be listening, you might be saying, Help. You know, I now I can look out for these. Now, now, what do I do? And honestly, my first big answer would be to say, be really, really nice to them. Really nice to them. And it kind of goes back to that kindergarten, you know, the golden rule, right? To treat other people as if you'd want to be treated, how you'd want to be treated. And I'm a big heart-to-heart person. And I realize, I do realize that can be, hard for leaders especially with that example I gave earlier with a manager herself this is that was a real story she's a really good person trying not to burden 
those under her, and just not having enough people. Or what do you do? You know. So and if that's if that's what's going on for you, just be honest. You know, God, we're all burnt out. Let's brainstorm and figure out what to do. I think leaders often have this, you know, sort of、um, mindset that they've got to be like the parent of the group. You can be a leader and be human at the same time. It's not like like any you know like if you let your guard down, somebody's going to take advantage of you. At least not with responsible grownups, anyway. And be honest, we're you know this is a situation that we're in post pandemic, and let's brainstorm. And and also I would say, well, we're going to get to that. We'll see if there's anything else left over. So, the most effective way to prevent employees from becoming energetically detached. And those are actually—I was going to say those were my words, but I think actually I got that from Aaron Dottie, who's another influencer. Energetically detached, because I do remember they're doing it with smiles on; otherwise, you can't smell it that much.、Um, is to stay on, stay on top of what's happening at at the workplace and in the in the environment, and constantly try to improve it. And I would say in small ways, really small ways. Be human, really, is is what we're talking about. So, this is a huge one. And I actually got this from a colleague of mine. If she's listening, she will know it's her. We were just having a conversation about this in general. It was actually right before I wrote this article, and we weren't talking about the quiet quitting actually per se. We were just talking about、um, leading to it, I, I guess. We were talking just about the post Rona vibes going on. So, so related, I suppose. But she was saying. How really, what we need leadership to do in general, in general across the country and probably world, is to listen to understand first. A lot of times, you know, leaders because leaders want to fix things, right? And that's good. We need leaders to fix things, but I don't think that should be first. And obviously, there are situations where it should be first. Example: buildings on fire, you know, run out the door. And also some things that are also, you know, obviously imminent. However, in most things that are, that involve, you know, the, the usual meetings that have, you know, the, whatever field you're in, I'm sure most people have meetings once a week, once a month, they're biweekly, whatever. These things, these chats, we're having about sales numbers or, you know, retention rates or whatever. Is listen first, just to understand. There isn't a human being on this planet. Who doesn't have a need to be heard and validated? That's just true. I don't. No matter what the demographics are, doesn't matter what the skin color is, how much money you come from, how much money you make now, whether you grew up in an urban environment or a rural environment, or we all need to be heard and under and understood and validated because this is what makes us human. We want to be on the grid. I mean, that's just it. So emotional validation. What I'm saying is central to the human experience. So when the work conversations are solely about numbers and reaching quotas, whether that's retention rates, whether that's sales quotas, or any other details related to workplace performance, the real people getting it all done often feel invisible. Those wizards behind the curtain just kind of fade out, and so that's why it's important to tune in and just, just I mean, really listen. Put the phone away, not upside down on the desk. Because that is not any more polite than leaving it face up on the desk. All that says is whoever might text or call, might you know, this is why it's sitting here, could possibly be more important than what you and what you're saying. So I'm just going to leave it there. It's absolutely obnoxious. Put the phone away and and to my contact and be attentive. And also mix up the dry meetings with some more genuine conversation to create balance. Right? How are we doing in the sales department? How are we doing on the police force? How are we doing?、Um, how is the emergency personnel doing? How are the faculty doing? How are the staff doing? Whatever, whatever, whatever. How are we doing? Those people working at Cole's department store. Pull them all together. How is it going? The second one is, when in doubt, ask. You know, we tend to think we're great mind readers. Well, not really. Okay, so get feedback from your employees in a way that feels safe, such as such as an anonymous survey. So here's the thing with anonymous surveys. Truthfully, if you really want to be anonymous, and people may not like this, the best way to do it is the old school, like ballot box, handwritten. I realize the, you know, obviously online is faster, right? 
though there's research on that and not everybody trusts that and there's a good reason because anything on the internet can be traced even if it says it's anonymous probably is anonymous but in the back of many people's heads they know if somebody wanted to find out their responses they could and that's just the facts so that can lead to false positives and here's the other little tidbit um is that uh some people who write the negatives on those internet based surveys might be your quiet quitters because they don't care if you know it's them. So it, basically I'm saying that those anonymous surveys can just be a pony show. That's what I'm saying. Okay, individual one-on-ones are ideal when you create an environment that truly feels safe for personal disclosure. I mean, really sit down and just I'm saying be human. That's the main theme of this whole talk right here. Uh you just can't go go wrong. When in doubt, have a heart to heart and just be vulnerable, you know? Cultivate emotional safety. So leaders are essential in creating an emotionally safe environment in the workplace. In a very broad sense, there are two ways to lead, right? Either with fear or with respect. Both will work. We know that, right? I I think I've had a really good experience with leaders. All I've had a really I have to say, I mean, I'm so grateful for my professional life all the way from getting out of graduate school and just landed at good agencies, good everywhere, you know how much I love Champlain. Um and I had I had a at one place I worked that was not in higher ed actually. Um I don't want to be too specific here just in case you know what well, actually I don't care if they listen I guess then they got an education, right? Um there was a little fear-based management going on and it was very uncomfortable and I hadn't experienced it before because um you know I had such good vibes all the time and it was just awful. You know, it was subtle, it wasn't like and it was clubbing us with a stick it was just fear based motivation and um that only goes so far it's not it'll work in the moment but not forever um so both will work one leads to much higher levels of happiness job satisfaction creativity and longevity so that we know that when we lead with respect um it, it's a win win for everybody and it's cheaper because you're not training people over and over again cuz you're going through them like Kleenex So when we treat people, you know, with agency and autonomy and um you know, you just respect that leader, you want to go out of your way for them. And my very best example of this is actually my husband. And though I'm biased, I happen to know it's true because I've hung around long enough to hear what people say about him and he just he because he he knows people and he takes them as individuals. He stays after when he needs to because something's going on in their life. He does a lot of rewarding with different and you know different things like appreciation little things constantly 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 and he's also flexible and they respect him because of it and he also knows how to draw a line in the sand so I mean respect goes all the way and they absolutely adore him where he is because he has so much respect for the pack that's what we're talking about here um number 4 is be aware that workplace politics are often the silent killer This is the truth. Um workplace politics are everywhere. We know that they're everywhere. Why? Cuz we're throwing human beings together. They're complicated and different, right? They're all different. People have agendas, people, you know, whatever whatever. So it's important for those in leadership positions to be aware of the dynamics and power differentials going on. Uh it's important to realize that employees may not feel free to speak honestly if they're if they are fearful of the political undercurrent. And you know, I've just talked to so many friends who have left different places. You know, friends of our friends who are, you know, not don't even work with me or whatever, but when they they talk about it afterwards, I mean, it's just so common that you know, they just they left cuz they, you know, just couldn't take the political undercurrent current anymore and you can't say it even if there's an open door for it. You can't always say it because if you know, there's that fear you're going to shoot yourself in both feet. I know as a professor I'm really aware of the power differential even though I would never use it. Never ever ever use it. But here's the thing is they don't know that. They're 18 years old or 19 years old. I have a couple seniors, but mostly I have the first years, 18 or 19 years old. So I'm so careful with every word and and you know, you know with you know different requests if you want to stop by my office. I'm just so careful about you know giving them agency for choosing meeting times and different things. and careful with just, you know, conversation in general because they're in a place where they might feel that there's a, a power differential. And it's important to be very mindful of that. 
Uh, Make employee mental health a priority. For real, though, if employees are encouraged to call in well on occasion, right, to practice self-care, but the undercurrent is giving the message that doing so will affect their stature at work, this is obviously going to backfire. You know, we know that. So just keep it real. I have to say, Champlain's really good where I work, and I don't mind saying positive shout-outs here. They're really, really good about saying if you you're not feeling well and well doesn't mean feeling or not feeling well doesn't necessarily mean you have the flu or the rona they mean well in general if you're not feeling well if you're feeling you know fried stay home you know just make your arrangements so you're not leaving anybody else you know just take care of your stuff and stay take a day and be remote or be just home and stay off your computer and they do encourage that i have to say that's a nice trickle down with the leadership at Champlain, and I, I would like to hope that that's that way everywhere. I know sometimes in corporate America, and granted, I don't, I can't speak for the entire United States. Obviously, I do know from my small, narrow, little experiences with with people in the corporate world over the years that they would say that, "Oh wow, I get two weeks vacation and a week of personal days," and they'll say, "Oh yes, you, you know, so you think, oh, in reality, of three weeks, you could." you know, call in well and go skiing and just let them think you're sick or whatever. But then if you call in, even if you call in sick, let's say you're actually sick, but you're not dying. And then if you do so and the timing isn't right, you might blow a promotion. Well, that's not keeping it real. If you're sick, you're sick, right? And then the next one is leadership is not one size fits all. You know, as they say, we are all snowflakes. You know, we're unique and different. So we can't manage people as if they're all the same either because that isn't going to work on the receiving end. No two of us are alike. Are alike. And so managerial interaction should therefore be sensitive to age, right? We don't, we don't um, manage someone who's fresh out of high school or college the same way as we would manage somebody in their 40s or 50s. Obviously, but it's not obvious to everybody. Kind of, I think I, I would hope it would be obvious, but it isn't. Developmentally, it's not even. They're not in the same track. You know, one's concerned about making their way in the world, and the other's concerned about, you know, um, retirement, maybe saving and taking care of aging parents and young adult children. Maybe they're having babies. Like it's all different. Then there's the 30s, and they are having babies. Maybe if they choose, it's just a, such a different thing. And, and then career-wise, they're in a different spot. So it's really important to take age into consideration, cognitive wiring, um, you know, the neurodivergent crew. It's very, very important to understand what makes them tick. Personality styles are all different. Learning styles are all different. Personal life circumstances are all different. And then the other unique differences that may be present. I mean, being a leader is a gigantic responsibility, obviously. Leaders, big L or small L, um, really have the potential to make a gigantic difference in someone's life. Gigantic difference with with how they manage. They've got the power to really get it done. And uh, yeah. Uh, seven, lunch. There's one very small way to show appreciation to employees is to feed them. Arrange for a lunch once a month that has no agenda whatsoever. No stats update know how many sales we had, no policy information, nothing about work. Just stave off the urge. Just don't do it. I remember I, uh, the first agency I worked for in Washington, DC, was talking about that early, which was, man, they had it down with this. And I've never forgotten it. I was 20, I was, I was 23 years old when I got out of graduate school and then engaged, married, blah, blah, blah. So that would have me about 25. I've never forgotten it. Um, We were put into teams when we started, and each team would take a turn to select the caterer for the monthly luncheon. And that's also when we got our paychecks. We got paid once a month, which is a bit of a drag when you're newlyweds. And actually, my husband and I both got paid on the same day. So it was like feast or food. We, like, started out eating steaks day one, and by day 29, we were on, like, our fifth day of pasta. But anyway, it wasn't really the point of that. But, um... So we got to eat. So each team on payday, when we did the luncheon, we would do Chinese and then we'd do Italian and then maybe Indian food or, uh, you know, Nepal food, whatever. And it was, and we, and we tried to not overlap. So it was, oh my gosh, it was so good. And I don't know if they ever declared the rule. It's been so long now, but they might have. But we didn't talk about that stuff. We, we were all together in the room. We all stayed 
I think it was an hour and a half they gave us to, right in the dead center of the work day, but it was once a month. And basically, we hung out, broke bread together, and talked. It was rejuvenating, it was enjoyable, and something we all looked forward to. And then the last one, and actually, honestly, I'm stealing this one from my husband, is give them, give your employees your, the birthday off. Take your birthday off. This is a small gesture. And look at the, look at it this way. It's one day a year. Who cares? Who really cares? And it makes that person feel special, even if they have no plans. They may have no plans. They can sit in their apartment or house on the beach, in the grass, in the park. Who cares? Knowing that somebody values them. This very small gesture goes very, very far. So I would strongly suggest to give your your employees their birthday off. And if this lands on a weekend, which eventually it will, if they stay long enough, which they will, right? If if, if this all if this all settles, um, then give them the Friday or Monday, and make this a mandatory practice. Like even if you have those type Ers, you know, that want to say, "Oh, I understand, but I really want to be here." No, don't allow them in the door. Mandatory practice. And that same agency was run run by two power women. They were amazing. They also gave us the day off after we had to be on the on call for the weekend. It was a, uh, it was a you know it's like a psychological. It was an agency for the homeless. Actually, it was very good. But when we were on call, as uh, social workers, psychologists, and everything, we had a, we had to. It was a mandatory take the Monday off. You wouldn't dare show up there because one of those two women was really strong personality. I mean, in a good way. You would not dare show your face there that Monday. She'd send you packing. Because it was about the agency, you take care of yourself, and then you're also better for here. So make it mandatory, and that's basically it. That is my shtick on quiet quitting. I didn't really plan it to be for this so this long, but this is a pretty big deal going on, at least in the states right now. And I'm gonna guess other places as as well. So that's it. This is Kimberly Quinn signing off from the beautiful Northern Vermont. Have a wonderful, mindful day.